Turn to Proverbs 6.15. Proverbs 6 and verse 15. So we're still talking about uh, the, the naughty man, the wicked person that we started talking about in verse 12. And it says, Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. And um, this will finish up that section, and then we will move into 16 through 19. We'll get to 16 yet tonight, and talking about more descriptions of this wicked man and things about him that, that God hates. And I realize that some of this stuff is um, negative, like this is negative preaching, because this is a, you know, the, this passage especially, and, and I do a share of negative preaching, but when I thought about it, there's a lot of negative stuff in the Bible, if you think, like, if you go back to, I was just thinking about this. Uh, if you go back to the Ten Commandments, for instance, in Exodus 20, and, and just look at how negative God is compared to how positive he is. Um, every single commandment, except for honor thy father and thy mother, has a negative attached, attached to it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, first one. Thou shalt not make the any graven image, second one. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Third one. Uh, the fourth commandment doesn't have a not in it right away, but then when you get down to uh, verse 10, in it thou shalt not do any work. The uh, fifth commandment is the only one that doesn't have a negative on it, to honor thy father and thy mother. And then the rest of them, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and so on. So there is a lot of uh, negative things in the scripture, so I suppose that's why uh, a lot of preaching ends up being telling you what not to do, because God has a lot of that to say. Uh, though he, there's plenty of encouraging and hopeful and good things in here as well. And as we go through Proverbs, we'll, we'll get to a lot of those things. Is it reasonable to think that when you follow all the knots and don't do the things you're not supposed to do, then you will get to experience a lot of positivity in your yes, life. Yes, right, exactly, yeah. You don't do what you're not supposed to do, and you will have a better life. Right, yeah, exactly, yep. Whereas on the other hand, you could follow a guy like these happy clappy preachers like Joel Osteen or something, and he could tell you how wonderful everything is, and you never hear a thou shalt not, you never hear anything negative, you never hear of any of the judgments of the Bible talked about, and yet you're spiritually destitute yeah you have no knowledge and no knowledge of not what to do and you end up your life ends up in shambles so yeah okay so anyway um, proverbs six fifteen. therefore shall his calamity come suddenly suddenly shall he be broken without remedy so let's look at the first part of that therefore shall his calamity come suddenly now as the old saying goes whenever you see a therefore ask what it's there for so usually therefore is is connecting this verse to the previous one. Therefore means in consequence of that, that being so, as a result or inference from what has been stated consequently. So this verse here is therefore connected to the ones that come before it, and it is a consequence of them. So the consequence of being a naughty person and a wicked man, walking with a froward mouth, like in verse 12, uh, having frowardness in your heart, devising mischief continually, sowing discord, verse 15. The result of that, the consequence of that, is what we have in verse 15. His calamity shall come suddenly. So the person that does these things ends up being judged for them as a result of the things that he did. And calamity is the state or condition of grievous affliction or adversity deep distress, trouble, or misery arising from some adverse circumstance or event. So calamity is, is not just a little bit of a misfortune. It's not stubbing your toe. It's not, you know, some little slap on the wrist. It's like major problems, grievous affliction, uh, deep distress and trouble and misery and things like that. So that's what the froward man has waiting for him. The naughty person, the wicked person that walks with a froward mouth and a froward heart, the guy that I described for the last couple of weeks, he's got calamity waiting for him, grievous affliction. Um, now, it doesn't always come right away. I'm going to talk about that. But it does eventually come. And when it comes, it comes suddenly. That's what it says here. Therefore, shall his calamity come suddenly. 
and suddenly means without warning or preparation, all at once, all of a sudden. So he might be going along his merry way and thinking he's getting away with murder or forwardness, what all kinds of wicked things that he's doing, and he will be even emboldened in those things because nothing's happening to me, right? You Christians out there are saying that God is going to judge people like me. Now look at me. Look at you. You're struggling. Look at me. Everything's great. But one day, it's going to come on him, and it's going to come on him suddenly. And life does often go well for wicked people for a time while they fill up their cup of iniquity. If you look in Genesis 15 and verse 6, this was said of the Amorites that were eventually going to be dispossessed of their land and the land of Canaan, but not yet, the Lord told Abraham, because their cup of iniquity was not full. In Genesis 15 and verse 16, it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So this is going to be a long, long time from then. The fourth generation, Abraham's people are going to come back to the land of Canaan where Abraham originally was, but they had to wait for the sin of the Amorites to get filled up. God was being long-suffering toward them. Now, when God's long-suffering towards his children, then if if their thoughts are right, if their uh, spirit's right, they are going to not take advantage of that, but they're going to be thankful for it and change their ways, right? And they realize, whoa, you know, I've really been, I've been out of the way here. And once they realize it and they realize, thankfully, my cup's not full yet because the Lord hasn't judged me yet, and they're going to be thankful for it and change. But wicked people, and turn with me to Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 12, wicked people don't look at it that way. They just say, oh, I haven't been judged yet. I'm never going to be judged. You know, God doesn't care about it. All these warnings in the Bible, they don't matter. It's just words that are written down by men and you know this stuff didn't come from God and there is no God right I'm not worried about that and they just keep doing evil over and over again uh, Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 12 says though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God which fear before him because we might have a tendency to think like the psalmist did in Psalm 73, where the wicked are just, they're getting away with murder, and they're so, they're, their hearts are fat, and they have more than heart could wish, and everything's just going so well for them. And here I am trying to do the right thing, and I'm not getting anywhere, and I'm just struggling, and I've got all this depression, or I've got temptation, and I've got, you know, all these, all these things in my life that, that my life's not going that well. But look at what Solomon says. The sinner can do evil a hundred times, and his days will be prolonged. He just keeps a hundred times over again, and he just keeps on going, and nothing seems to happen. But look what Solomon says. Surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. Eventually, it will be well with people that fear God. And eventually, the wicked will get judged. So you never want to give up. You know, you never want to give up, especially in the, in the ninth <coughs> inning, or in the fourth uh, quarter, or in the third period, or whatever your sports analogy is. It'd be kind of like a guy, and this is a total geek analogy, but it'd be like a guy that sees, thinks the stock market's a big, fat, ugly bubble and says, you know what, I'm going to short this thing, which means that you're going to buy it now and then sell it whenever, it's, you know, whenever it, it goes down. You can actually make money when it goes down. And the guy says, I'm going to short it, and then it keeps going up, and it keeps going up, and it keeps going up, and then he starts doubting himself, like, oh, I don't know, should I, should I back out? Because the more it goes up, the more money he's losing. It's just the opposite of, of if you owned it. But if he holds on, and he was right, eventually he's going to have a big payoff at the end. But if he gets weary as it's going up and thinks, ah, I just can't take it anymore, and he sells out, then he he loses a ton, right? So that's a geek analogy. But it's the same way. The sinner may do, do, you know, a hundred times and keep doing well, and the righteous may get wearied about that. But if you hold on till the end, their reward does come. It does pay off to do the right thing. I'm not suggesting you short the stock market or anything like that. That's a good way to lose your shirt. But anyway, it was just an example. So because of this, because the wicked can do evil a hundred times and it just seems like nothing's, you know, payday is never going to come, the heart of them is fully set to do evil. Let's just back up one verse. It says, Ecclesiastes 8.11, because, ex- uh, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. 
it works this way with kids in a school classroom, right? One, you know, at first everybody's afraid to do anything bad and because they might get in trouble. And then one kid gets up a little bit of courage and maybe he mouths off to the teacher. Or he throws a spitball at somebody and nothing happens. Oh, and well, he does it again. And then another kid does it. And then they keep doing it. And they realize, oh, we're not getting in trouble. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And it's just a, it's a total madhouse in there. And they think because sentence against the evil work has not been executed speedily, now they are emboldened and they're just going to keep doing it. Um, and that's what happens with wicked people too. They sin and they sin and they sin and they think that nothing's happening. I mean, no lightning down from heaven. No, nothing's happened to me. Their, their heart is fully emboldened, fully set in them to do evil. This is why we probably have a fairly high murder rate in this country because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, right? If you kill somebody in this country, you're going to, if you even get the death penalty, which is probably pretty rare, hardly, I don't think hardly anybody gets it anymore, you're going to sit on death row for a long time, 20 years sometimes, and therefore people are, you know, they're, they're not as afraid um, of the punishment as they should be. And it can seem sometimes like it takes forever while we wait to be avenged of our persecutors. And this is what happened to the martyrs in heaven. In Revelation 6 and verse 10, they had been martyred on the earth. It doesn't say how many years prior to this they'd been martyred, but it seems like it's probably, I'm, I'm guessing, make, it would make sense, that the people that martyred them are still alive on earth as they're saying this thing to God, right? Because otherwise, why would they be waiting for their blood to be avenged? Those people would be in hell, right? So they're waiting to be avenged. Um, but, you know, they could have been martyred whenever they were 20 years old, and 40, 50 years could have passed by, and they're up in heaven and they're waiting. How long? Lord, I'll read it to you. Uh, Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, they're still on the earth. They have been martyred by these people. And they're wondering, How long, Lord? Why are you waiting? Right? I've, I've been up here potentially for years. And those people down there are just doing evil a hundred times and their days are prolonged. Why, Lord? They want to know. And you probably have found yourself wondering, why does God allow the wicked people to do the wicked things that they have done? And they just keep getting away with it. They, they get away with murder. They get away with all kinds of things. Why does God allow it? Well, he's, he's long-suffering, but not forever. See, when the judgment time finally comes from God, it comes suddenly and grievously. Let's look at uh, Psalm 37, verses 1 through 2. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 2. You know, it's just like the serial killer, and some of those guys, they get away with it for years, sometimes decades. And they, they kill numerous people. They might take breaks for, for months or years, and they probably think they're getting away with it. And then suddenly, they're caught. One day, something happens, they slip up, and that's it. They're, they're done. They're in prison and hopefully executed. But it can go on for a long time before it happens. Psalm, sorry? Just too gruesome in front of him, but there was a very heinous um, type thing that happened when Carrie was expecting Paige, so it's been that long mm. ago. And um, this woman who did it had, was just executed on the last day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Finally, really? Yeah. yeah. And it was no kidding. Really? Yeah. Huh. So, how, yeah. how old Paige is is how long that's been. Yeah. Especially that being the news. Yeah. Skidmore. Mm -hmm. no, did, Everything evil happens in I Skidmore. Know it was in Skidmore. <laughs> did she get caught 15 years ago and it just took no. that long to the, be executed? Yeah, yeah. She, oh, okay. Yeah, she, it yeah. wasn't very long later. That's outrageous. Back in the day, they would try you. I don't know how long it would take to try you, and you'd be hung, right? Or hanged yeah. immediately. And like, it's crazy. Jenny and I, on that trip to Detroit, we were talking about expediency and that sometimes, you know, it probably does mean that sometimes mm. the wrong guy gets done in. Yes. And Jenny said, okay, but how many guys are we talking about? Like, you got to wake yeah. it up, you yeah. know, unfortunately. Yeah. But, yeah. And we laughed it off, you know, like, well, how many times? But seriously, yeah. it would be a little bit of an issue. 
It there would. also be more of a deterrent. Right. Yeah. yeah. There'd be less of these crimes being tried if people knew that, you know, when the yeah. hammer right. slammed down, you were getting yeah. drugged yeah. outside and shot right yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. There'd be less chances for the wrong guy to get charged because yes. there'd be less crimes happening. Yes, mm -hmm. yep, that's true. Because you don't, God's law is perfect, and you don't find 10 or 20 years of death row in God's law. <laughs> if you were guilty of death, you died right there. Yep. Uh, Psalm 37, 1 through 2 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. To fret means to get all, to let it chafe you, to let it rub you the wrong way, to let to get angry about it and start fuming and fussing and yelling and screaming. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. It's like I said back there in the last spring whenever I preached a sermon on this passage here, and I said, pray that God gets the weed eater out, because one of these days he's going to, and he, they are going to be soon cut down, just like the grass. Sometimes the grass gets to grow really high, but eventually it's going to come out, and they will be cut down, and it'll happen in, a, in an instant. Look at the Proverbs 3 and verse 25. So this is a negative sermon, but it's negative against bad people, so I guess that's not so bad. shouldn't depress you. Uh, Proverbs 3 and verse 25. Just don't be one of those bad people, because you'll soon be cut down too. So, uh, Proverbs 3.25. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. So the sudden fear and the desolation is the desolation that happens to the wicked. Um, and we don't need to be afraid of that as long as we're on God's side, as long as we're living righteously, then we don't have to worry about sudden fear gripping us like they do. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse 1. Proverbs 29, 1. It says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Think about the teenage boy that has been reproved numerous times about drinking and driving. And he just keeps doing it. Oh, nothing's going to happen to me. I, I can do it. I know how to do it. I can drive better drunk than I can sober. You ever heard somebody stupid, some idiot say that? I've heard people say that. And one day, there he's dead. <coughs> Head on collision. Suddenly it happens. Often reproved, hardened his neck, suddenly destroyed, and without remedy. I'll talk about that without remedy here in a minute. That'll be the second part of this verse. And then we have uh, what will happen at the end of time. And the same thing, God's judgment, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3, God's judgment at the end of time will be uh, the culmination of all of his judgments, whether they, if they didn't happen yet, all the wrongs are going to be righted, and this judgment will happen like lesser judgments happen. Lesser judgments wait a long time to happen, and then it happens suddenly. Well, God's final judgment will be the same way. And it'll be just like it was where we read there in, in Ecclesiastes. Sinners do an evil a hundred times, and it, their, their days are prolonged, and they think nothing's going to happen. And look, at, look what we read here, First Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say peace and safety, see, they think everything's good, right? Judgment has been delayed. Sentence against an evil work hasn't been executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. They shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. In other words, there will be no remedy. They're not going to get out of it. So you, you know... Whenever, if this happens, and I don't, you know, who knows if it's going to be this obvious or not, but if someday all of a sudden world peace is achieved, and that probably happens after some totalitarian government rises or something, but if someday world peace is achieved and everybody, all the wicked people are saying peace and safety, get ready, look up for your redemption to our nigh. Um, that's going to be the time whenever it happens. And usually that, you know, or not usually, that's probably going to be the same time in Revelation 20 when the camp of the saints is surrounded. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's safety for, some. <laughs> for everybody else. For those in the concentration camp, not so much. But look up, because your redemption draweth nigh. Now, I'll give you an example, a historical example of this. 
and that is uh, the example of Babylon. Uh, the destruction of Babylon came suddenly. Look at Isaiah 47, verse 11. I didn't uh, end up sending you out the outline until today, which is usually a day late. I usually do it on Tuesday, and I had a bunch of other things came up yesterday that took up all my time, and I, I couldn't get to it. And I'm glad that I didn't, because I read Isaiah 47 this morning in my Bible reading, and I came across this passage, and I thought, boy, this is interesting, and I made some notes on it. And then I pulled up this outline to review and print out an email, and I thought, boy, I, this would fit in here just perfectly. So I'm glad that I didn't get it sent out yesterday. So Babylon's destruction was prophesied here by Isaiah that it would come suddenly, and I'll show you that it did. But Isaiah 47 and verse 11, it says, Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off. going to be no remedy, in other words. And des desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. And he's prophesying in Babylon, you can see there in the first verse. Um, he's speaking of Babylon. So her destruction, her desolation was going to come suddenly. She wasn't going to expect it. It was going to happen all of a sudden. But this happened after she had been unmerciful. Verse 6 says, I was wroth with my people. Uh, I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. This is, God was mad at Israel, his people. He gave them into Babylon's hand. He says, Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. So even upon old people, they were, they were not even merciful upon the old people. And God is taking them to task for this. Very similar to what happened with Ahaz and Israel whenever he got taken over. Remember what we've been looking at in the, in the sermon there on, on uh, 2 Kings 16? Where they didn't have mercy, they were, they were too harsh, and the Lord rebuked them. So here Babylon has been unmerciful. Uh, they've been given to pleasure, verse 8. Therefore hear this now, thou that art given to pleasures... Uh, they had been dwelling carelessly, that dwelleth carelessly, um, and they had been very proud, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. I am, and none beside me. Like, I am the, the greatest nation that's ever lived. You know, kind of like another nation uh, that we hear about a lot of times that think they're the exceptional nation as well, the best one. And Babylon had been trusting in herself. There in verse 10, For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. That's quite a thing to trust in. But, you know, don't, doesn't our country trust in our wickedness? We trust in our power and might to just smash other nations whenever we feel like it. We trust in that. And then she was also full of her own wisdom. She had a, a uh, she was wise in her own conceit. It says, um, Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside thee. You know, we're told that uh, knowledge puffeth up in the Bible, but charity edifieth. She was puffed up by her wisdom. And isn't that similar to the way that we are today? Everybody's so highly educated, right? Everybody has degrees now, and we're all puffed up because of our education, because of our supposed wisdom. So here Babylon is probably for a long time, right? They've been unmerciful. They've been given to pleasure. They've been dwelling carelessly. They've been proud, trusting in herself. And she's been wise in her own conceit, full of her own knowledge. But that would come to an end and her destruction would come suddenly. Now I've alluded to it, but doesn't that sound like another nation that we're all quite familiar with, right? We're the same way, exactly the same way. Unmerciful towards other people, given to pleasures, bread and circus society, dwelling carelessly. Nobody's worried about a thing because we're, we're the exceptional people. Full of ourselves, proud, right? Puffed up with our knowledge, trusting in ourselves. But Babylon was destroyed suddenly. Turn with me to Daniel 5, 30 through 31. See, God promised this, prophesied it, and... When God prophesies something, it comes to pass, and it surely did. You'll remember when Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, he was the king after Nebuchadnezzar, he made a feast and drank wine with all of his lords and his people. And they drank wine out of the, the 
the uh, the cups and uh, the things from the vessels from the temple, and they were profaning God's holy things. And there was a hand writing on the wall. And the, the, when the king saw that, he fulfilled another prophecy when his loins began to shake because the Lord said he would loose the loins of kings in Isaiah, I think it was maybe 45. But anyway, he called in Daniel and Daniel interpreted the meaning there when it said, meaning, meaning, tiko upharsin, which meant that God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it and thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Thy kingdom is delivered and given to the Medes and the Persians there in verses 27 and 28. It says, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a gold chain about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. That night. Babylon was a world empire, the most powerful in its day, and in one night it was destroyed. And I've told you how this happened before, and this was prophesied also in the book of Isaiah. In their drunken stupor, this very night, they left the gates open. There was a river that ran through the middle of Babylon, and they had these big gates that the river would run through. And they left the gates open. And the Medes and the Persians diverted the Darius and, and Cyrus, yeah, Darius and Cyrus um, diverted the river, and they marched right through the riverbed, right into the city, and took it that night. And uh, Belshazzar was killed. One night, that's all it took. Her, de- her desolation came suddenly. And then we read of another Babylon, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, in Revelation 17 and 18. And this Babylon, interestingly enough, will be destroyed the very same way. Revelation 18, 10 and 19. So he's, he's speaking to Babylon the great here in verse 2. And then in, in verse 10, Revelation 18:10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. One hour. This powerful religious system, this worldly system, what exactly it is, you know, I don't, I don't fully understand. I know the, the, the Catholic Church makes up a big part of it, but I don't think it's limited to that. But whatever this whole system is, it's similar to the ancient Babylon. The Roman Catholic Church has adopted most of Babylon's customs and religious customs into their religion. Uh, but anyway, whatever it is, it's destroyed in one hour. You get down to verse 19. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherewith or wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Sudden destruction. This is the same Babylon that persecuted the saints. We read about in Revelation 17. And was drunk with the blood of the martyrs. And fornicated with the kings of the earth. And they waited. And we've been waiting for a long time. Hundreds of years. And in one hour, it'll be destroyed. So while they're casting dust on their heads and crying and weeping and wailing, God's children are smiling. Yes, yeah. Yep. And then the rest of uh, this verse here in Proverbs 6.15, it says, Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. So his desolation shall come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. So let's look at that. The wicked are broken. Broken means separated forcibly into parts, in fragments, in pieces. So... Think about that. Um, think about being drawn and quartered, <laughs> separated into parts, broken. Um, now, this is speaking figuratively about the wicked being broken, although God could draw them and quarter them if he wanted to. That would be quite the punishment. But uh, figuratively, they will be um, destroyed, broken into pieces. Um, and, and the Lord does speak about um, breaking the wicked. I'll give you a few verses here. Uh, the psalmist actually pled for God to do so in Psalm 10 and verse 15. He asked them to ask the Lord to break their arms. Psalm 10 and verse 15. <clears throat> it says, Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. So there's nothing wrong with praying that God will judge the wicked. 
just when you do so, just remember that but by the grace of God, there go you, right? We could, we could all be there too, but there's nothing wrong with asking God to judge them. And my prayer is for the people in high places that God will either convert them or destroy them. And I, I pray that rather regularly. Either convert them if they're, children, if they're thy children or else destroy them otherwise, that they stop oppressing us. And then, this is kind of gross, but it says, um, and, and uh, the psalmist pled for this also, that the Lord would break their teeth. Uh, Psalm 58 and verse 6. I don't pray for this because I don't like, I have, I've had a broken tooth before. On my front one, I got broken in half. And I just, uh, I, don't, I don't like that. So I'm not praying for that. But, uh, you know, God can do that. That's his business. But anyway, here's what David prayed. He says, break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. And I believe David, obviously, is speaking figuratively here, too. Because what do they use their teeth for? They bite and devour, right? They gnash on people with their teeth. So this is a, a, you know, figuratively breaking their teeth out. And we're told in Psalm 2, in verse 9, that the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a prophecy of him being crucified and then reigning in heaven and coming back to judge. Uh, Psalm 2 and verse 9, it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So yes, the Lord is going to break them. And he's going to break them suddenly without remedy. This will happen at the second coming, but this also happens to sinners in this life. And... You know, we, we even describe people like that. He's broken, right? I mean, don't, we, don't we talk about people like that? Right? God can break you. And he can break wicked people, and he will. So, if you're harboring sin in your life, repent of it now. Because desolation will come suddenly one day, if you don't. And the wicked will be broken without remedy. Remedy, number one, is a cure for a disease or other disorder of body or mind any medicine or treatment which alleviates pain and promotes restoration of health. Think about it like we talk about home remedies, right? That's like a, you know, something that you can do to cure a disease. But then remedy, secondly, means, and this is the way that it's used here, uh, it, it's a means of counteracting or removing an outward evil of any kind, reparation, redress, relief. So when the judgment of the wicked comes, there will be no redress or relief. God's not going to back off. Whenever it finally happens, that's it. There's no changing his mind at that point. Proverbs 29.1, I told you we would get back to that. It says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. There's going to be no reprieve. There's going to be no redress. Once, God's, once your cup is full and God is going to judge, then you're going to have to deal with the punishment. And, and that's what will happen to the wicked. That's what happened to the nation of Israel in Second Chronicles 36. They kept sinning and sinning and sinning, doing even worse than the heathen, and the Lord finally had enough. It says there that they had the, the chief priest and the people, so it was the religious leadership, it was the people, it was everybody. They transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem there in verse 14, Second Chronicles 36, 14. And he sent them prophets and they, they rejected his prophets and they mocked them and despised their words and misused them there in verse 16. And the Lord finally had enough. It says there in verse 16, But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose, arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the, Chaldea, the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. That's what we read about there in Isaiah 47. Right, that they had no compassion, no mercy on the ancient. Um, the Lord delivered them all into there. So uh, 